Okay, so our real topic today is the Beatitudes. And uh, this all started from um, when Pastor Joe, uh, last week or the week before, gave me a copy of the lesson book that COG7 is using right now. And um, the lesson book is a study of the Beatitudes. And so you remember those lesson books that we had? They had uh, 13 weeks of lessons in them, uh, 13 chapters in, in each of the books. And we would work through those back when we were at NHU. And so it's a study like that, uh, but it's on the topic of the Beatitudes. And, and what you look at, when you look at that, you see that the author believes that the, the Beatitudes are a step-by-step -step plan for becoming better disciples. And so he sees that whole book as a discipleship book. And, uh, teaching people how to be better disciples. And he, you also see that when you look at it, that, that he believes that the, the Beatitudes blessings are blessings in the present time. They're not in the future. They're, they're in our current time blessings that we receive from uh, doing these step-by-step -step plan uh, that he sees in the Beatitudes. But the author is wrong on both. Um, the Beatitudes are, are just not that. Um, and, and he does uh, source where he got this idea from. There's, there's another writer that he got this idea from, and he's presenting that in that booklet. And, and he also doesn't correctly understand the Beatitudes, and we'll spend a lot more time on, on that than on the other things that he talks about. And, and the problem there is that most pastors and most commentators, commentaries, um, don't understand uh, the Beatitudes correctly. And that's because there are two completely different understandings of the Beatitudes. For people who just read the Bible and read through it, you will see, um, you'll read the Beatitudes and you'll understand them one way. But uh, the people who are teaching pastors and commenting on Bible and things like that have a completely different understanding of that. And so we'll be looking at why that under, those two different understandings exist and, and why, they, uh, why they exist and which one is the correct one. Um, and so, um, but going back to this lesson booklet, so after th 13 weeks in this lesson booklet, the students will have less understanding of the Bible than they had going in. And uh, that's kind of sad. And that goes back to a talk I had a couple weeks ago um, about the state of Christianity generally. So in any case, going through all of this made me realize that I had never taught the Beatitudes as a group. I I'd, I'd taught one Beatitude uh, or one in a, in a separate lesson and um, not all of them all together. And, and I think I did that because I thought it really isn't challenging stuff. You can just read it and pretty much understand it. And, and so most people have a pretty good understanding of it. And, uh, it, and it's well-trodden territory. I've, I've heard it preached a number of times. Although I have to admit that sometimes I heard people preach uh, things that I thought were strange. And what I was hearing was that other understanding. And I didn't really realize that there were two separate understandings of it until I really got into this. I knew that there was a translation problem uh, in there, and, and, uh, but I didn't realize that there was a kind of a standard way that had been developed among um, the theolo theolo theologians, I guess, um, to fix that translation problem. And, I, and, um, and would they do that by uh, putting in a new interpretation of those Beatitudes that's completely different from, from what you would read in the text. What you would read in the text simply doesn't match up with that other understanding. And, and we'll look at that. Um, and so the question here, of course, is how can we know what Jesus is saying and which understanding should we use if we're going to be teaching the Beatitudes? So we're going to look at, at a number of things. We're going to be looking at the original language text um, and the translation that was taken from that and the interpretation that's being added on top of that and, and see if those are valid things that are being done. And we're also going to compare the English text that we have with the English text of the same verses in other Bible books. And so those are two different techniques that you can use yourself if there's something in the Bible that you're not understanding or if somebody is telling you something different about. You, one of them is you can go back to the original language text. And I don't speak Greek. Um, I, I, I don't speak Greek. and I, I don't know many Greek words. I know more Hebrew words than I know Greek words. And, and so I, I get along by using all the different online tools that are available. There are translators and there are translations in different uh, languages and there are interlinears. And uh, there's a whole pile of tools you can use that will really give you a step up to understanding what the Greek is saying. So, um, so these two methods are, are two methods that you can use yourself sometimes. And so that's part of what you can gain by, from the lesson that we're going to go through here today. And so the problem really comes from the very first beatitude. And, and we've seen that mentioned so many times. It says, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's, that one is from the NIV, but the others are very, very similar to that, um, except for the interlinears. Now, that's kind of interesting. If you go to an interlinear, um, 
and, and, and look at that, you will find the other interpretation, the other understanding of the Beatitudes presented there instead of the actual words that are in the Bible. And uh, when I saw that, I was a bit concerned by that. It seemed wrong to be putting an interpretation by man as representing it as the Bible, but interlinears do do that kind of thing. Um, so, or not interlinears, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, paraphrases do that kind of thing. So, um, so there are these two understandings of the Beatitudes and it comes from this poor in spirit that I've highlighted. That clause there is causing a lot of trouble. And, and so what you see there is the usual translations. It says poor in spirit. But when you think about what does this mean, blessed are the poor in spirit, it doesn't make any sense. Why would the poor in spirit be blessed? That seems kind of odd. Wouldn't you bless those who were strong in the spirit or rich in the spirit? Does God prefer that we be poor in the spirit? Is that some sort of an indication that God wants us to be poor and therefore rewards us for being poor? poor? <laughs> and, and, and so... Also, that brings up the question of if there are poor in spirit, then who would be the rich in spirit? Um, and, and if there are people who are rich in spirit, then would they not receive the kingdom of heaven? If the kingdom of heaven is going to the poorer spirit, do the rich in spirit not get it? So when you, you think of it that way, you say, boy, there's a lot of unexplainability in that. And this is understood by everybody that has studied it. Um, all of the people I talked about, the translators and, and others, uh, that look at this say that doesn't make sense right there and and um, and it doesn't the way they're understanding it for sure and and um, there's another aspect of this that's a problem and that poor in the spirit the word behind spirit is ruach which is either a reference to the holy spirit or to man's own spirit it's that kind of a spirit it's not just a, a sense of spirituality um, and and so um, meaning that um, how can we be poor in the spirit could we somehow be poor in, in our own spirit or poor in the Holy Spirit. And, and when you think of what poor in the spirit means, if you said poor in money, you would know that that means that you have little money. And, and so you'd think that poor in the spirit would also mean that you have little spirit. But how can you have little Holy Spirit in you? This Holy Spirit it seems to be either a yes or no. It, there doesn't seem to be, I've got half of a Holy Spirit in me. No ideas like that in the Bible. And, and so how could you be poor in, in the spirit in that sense? And, and, um, and so the English here is also uh, flawed. It, it's what it says doesn't make sense because if you're talking about the Holy Spirit or even man's own spirit, you wouldn't say poor in spirit. You would say poor in the spirit because that's proper English that way. Just like we see in the Bible, um, Paul tells us to pray in the spirit. And so we always use the word the in that case with, with um, the, the Holy Spirit or our own spirit, in fact. And so all of these problems sit there in the, in the English text, and, uh, and this is what is causing the problem, is that the people are trying to uh, fix this and, and say, well, it doesn't make sense this way, so how can we understand it in another way that does make sense? And so the fix that, that comes, um, and here's the NIV verse again, I just brought it in for you to look at, um, is um, they use an interpretation that shifts the literal meaning of the text. So what you see here as blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They are putting an interpretation on top of this that, that shifts the meaning of the words. And, and, and so to make it work and make it make sense is what they're trying to do. And so in this fix, they take the words poor in spirit that you see in the verse there, and they understand that as, as meaning spiritually poor. But spiritually poor isn't the same thing as poor in spirit. As we talked about before, Poor in spirit would mean that you don't have very much of, of the Holy Spirit, you would expect that to mean. But a person who is spiritually poor is a person that we would call a worldly person. He doesn't have a spiritual sense. He doesn't live a spiritual life. And so those are already two different meanings. And, and so if you go down this road, you're beginning to really get away from what the verse is saying in, in um, ways that are uncomfortable to me. And so the next step of once you've changed poor in spirit to spiritually poor is you twist that into the idea of recognizing your own spiritual bankruptcy, okay? And, and so um, they've really changed it with that. Now you've gone from people who are spiritually poor to recognizing a personal spiritual bankruptcy. And, and so you really, really shifted the text from what's written in the Bible uh, into this, this new interpretation. And so once you've done that, the verse becomes, blessed are those who understand that they have absolutely nothing of worth to offer God for theirs is salvation. 
no person could take this verse up here and, and no rational person could take that and come up with this and say, oh yeah, I, I read that verse and this is what it means. It's talking about those people who understand that they have absolutely nothing of worth to offer God. And, and so that was the fix that they came up with. And, and, and because they've changed this verse the, 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 or this beatitude, the one about the poor in spirit, um, you have to change all the other beatitudes in the same way because you, you've made this real twist in them. And, and, and uh, when you do that, you realize that the very last beatitude of all of them just can't be twisted that way. And so you have to throw it out. You can't include it in this. And, and so there's already a lot of indications of problems with this, this attempt to fix it by doing this, in, this interpretation. And so what do we do to see if the interpretation is right or whether the Bible is literally right? And, and how do we resolve this problem of what does it mean within the spirit? And, and so um, that's, we'll spend some time here. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. So we're going to, the two methods that I talked about for how do we check things in the Bible. The one we're going to be looking at here is checking the translation. And so what we see um, in the NIV, again, there's that poor in the spirit clause. And, and the word the is not in NIV. And so I put it in parenthesis here to mark it, but it is in the Greek. And, and, um, and part of the problem here is that the Greek is unclear in what it says. And so I've, I've done a very direct translation of just the first part of this uh, sentence here um, to help you understand what the Greek says. So the Greek says, blessed are the poor, the spirit. And so we in English would find that uh, not possible to understand because Greek is different that way. Um, Greek uh, doesn't use prepositions like we do. What you're supposed to do when you read the Greek is you're supposed to find the preposition that's missing here. And, and so we would have a, a preposition in there that would relate the, the, the two different nouns. The, one noun is the poor, meaning the poor people, and the other noun is the spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. And, and so what's the relationship between them? And, and there are lots of possibilities. Um, English really loves uh, these prepositions and has many, many of them. Um, they, Greek doesn't have so many, um, Hebrew doesn't have so many either. And so, um, but we need that. We always put it in our, our writing here. And so the possible choices are, it could be in, so that the poor in the spirit, it could be to, poor to the spirit, or it could be by, poor by the spirit. So you, you see how that preposition fits in there in English. And so you, we need to make a good English sentence. And to do that, we need to put a preposition in there when we're converting this from the Greek into English. And, and the one that's being chosen by the translators is in. And that's all translations that, that I could check um, are all using in there. Nobody is using to, nobody's using by. And then the next thing they do once they've chosen the uh, particular uh, um, word, word that they're going to use there, preposition that they're going to use there, they take the word out. The word the comes out of, of here. So this word that I've marked uh, here, um, they take that out. And, and sometimes that's a legitimate thing to do in Greek um, because uh, the way English works. But when you're talking about something like the spirit, um, you, you don't do that. I, I gave you the example earlier of pray in the spirit. So the word the should be staying in here, but the word the is removed and it seems like it's being removed to make this interpretation a little smoother so that you can apply the interpretation and not stumble over the word the that's in there. So then they take um, the poor in spirit that they've reduced it down to and, and treat that as a noun phrase. Now, this is great, grade 12 stuff that you probably learned, but I'm sure you haven't used it in many years and don't remember um, what a noun phrase is. But it, clearly in the Greek, there are two separate nouns and it's not a noun phrase. And, and so what we see here uh, entirely is that there's been a lot of poor choices, you, I would think, uh, in the Greek uh, translation that's been done. Um, they selectively choose only this preposition. They remove the the that shouldn't be removed, and then they convert it into a noun phrase. So we're already seeing some things in the translation that, that look really bad for this interpretation and, and the, the machinations that they have to go through to make this interpretation work. And so once they've converted it into this poor of, uh, in spirit noun phrase, they, they re-understand it, as I said before, as meaning spiritually poor, and then they twist that into meaning recognizing your own spiritual bankruptcy. So when you check the translation that way, it doesn't look good. It, it looks like an awful lot of strange things have been done to try to make this interpretation work. 
Okay. Understand if I may. Yep. Looking at the New Living Translation, because I, I use the Bible Gateway a lot because it's online, and of course it's free. Uh, but there's a New Living Translation of Matthew 5, 3 that says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. Yes. So that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Yeah. So I guess they, they kind of figured that out too. Well, you know, see, that's the interpretation coming in. Um, uh, and that's a paraphrase that you're looking at, um, and there are other paraphrases that do the same thing. I think um, Chance used to use the God's Word, um, and I don't know if he does anymore, but God's Word is another one that I looked at. And they, they have that interpretation in there as well, and they're, they're throwing in this idea of understanding your lack of spiritual value and that you can contribute nothing to it. They word it in different ways, in, in different ones, but what you're seeing there is that interpretation coming in. <clears throat> okay, so um, going back to the, the different ways that you can use to try and understand what the Bible is saying when it's not clear. Um, the other one is to compare what you see in one place with the same words in another place. And there are lots of uh, places in the Bible where things are repeated, but repeated just a little bit differently. And when they're repeated a little bit differently, you can compare the two and see what the differences are and, and uh, figure out why they're different and what those differences can tell you. And so that's what we're going to do here is we're going to there is a repetition of the Beatitudes or at least part of the Beatitudes. Um, and we're, we're going to look at that and we're going to compare what it says there with what we see in Matthew. Matthew is really our source text here. And, and I'm going to give you just the highlights in advance and then we'll go through it. So in this repetition of, of the, some of the Beatitudes, uh, we're going to see that that the one about the poor doesn't contain the words in the spirit. That, that part is is gone. And uh, it also speaks of the rich. So the, this repetition has, um, it doesn't just talk about the poor in the spirit, it talks about rich in the spirit. And, and so that brings up that question I had earlier, of what does it mean to be rich in the spirit if, if that's what it's talking about? And, and, um, and that's a, a difficult thing because there isn't a biblical concept about being rich or poor in the spirit. And, and so, um, and what we see in that other um, uh, set of, of the Beatitudes, uh, we see that uh, it places a woe, which is like a negative blessing or, or a curse on, on rich people because they have enjoyed their comfort. And, and the only way you can enjoy your comfort uh, from being rich is being wealthy rich. Um, physical wealth can bring you comfort, but spiritual wealth doesn't bring you comfort. Um, we are spiritually wealthy people, but we aren't comfort, comfortable because of that. And so every commentary and, and every teacher accepts that this other set of Beatitudes is talking about uh, physically poor and the physically rich. And they're talking about that uh, idea that they're talking about physical wealth in those. And so what we ha are, are going to see here is that um, this set of Beatitudes is speaking about the physically poor. And, and uh, that's what we'll cover right away. And so this other set of Beatitudes comes from Luke. And, and um, Luke only lists a few of them, four of them, um, and not the full set. But you can tell from what they are that they are the same Beatitudes. And so I'll read this for you. It says, this is from Luke 6, verse 20 through 23. And it says, and he lifted his eyes upon his disciples, and he said, blessed are you poor ones, because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you whenever men shall hate you and shall separate you and shall insult you and shall cast out your name as evil for the Son of God, the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. For so were their fathers doing to the prophets. Now that, those are very similar to Matthew's account, in, except that Matthew has a few more of the blessings. Um, and so what we do see here is that there is no mention of in the spirit, in spirit, nothing like that for the poor. It just says, blessed are the poor ones, because yours is the kingdom of God. So the only thing that's different in that beatitude is, it, is that in the spirit clause that, that, was, uh, that came right after poor here. And, and um, so what we also see that's different in Luke, it comes in the next verses that follow after this. And, and so Luke's account um, provides something that Matthew's account doesn't. He has these matching set of anti-beatitudes, these negative beatitudes, these curses or woes. And, and, and so, but they're still organized in the same way as the others. They, they, um, where the other ones said um, a blessing uh, to the, the poor, 
it, this says a woe to the rich. So, um, but, but woe to the rich men, for you have received your comfort. So what that's saying is that um, by way of your richness, you have received comfort in your life and you will not receive comfort in the future, uh, meaning after you die. So uh, and on to verse 25, woe to you satisfied ones, for you shall hunger. So the other one said, uh, blessed are you who hunger, for you will be satisfied. So it, it is just taking those other Beatitudes that Luke had and, and all four of the same ones and turning them around into woes. But we do learn something from that. We saw that um, the idea of rich men and the comfort. And, and uh, the only way that you get comfort uh, is from wealth. Wealth can give you comfort, but um, a, a spiritual rich person doesn't get comfort from that. So continuing on through the end of this, woe to you who are laughing now, for you shall weep and you shall wail. Woe to you when men say, when men shall say wonderful things about you, for so were their fathers doing to the false prophets. Okay, so Luke is a little different there, and those differences are helping us to understand um, what the Beatitudes are about. And, and what we see there is um, that he doesn't mention in the spirit. Um, so, but plainly, this is the Beatitudes. We can see um, that although the words are a little bit different, the, all the same idea between those four Beatitudes here in Luke are the same as what we see in Matthew. And so it, it's obvious in Luke that Jesus is speaking about the physically poor and the physically rich. And, and everybody agrees to that. Everybody, uh, all the analysts that I looked at uh, agree to that, that, that Luke is talking about physically poor, not spiritually poor. And so um, that makes it clear that, that physically poor is in focus in Matthew as well, but a lot of people simply won't accept that. They, they want to see Matthew's version where it says in the spirit as being a different thing and under this new interpretation. And, and but you, it isn't fair to do that. And, and I saw that in a lot of the um, uh, people who are doing analysis of this and comparing these two texts. And, and they, they would say, yes, Luke is plainly talking about the physically poor, and, but Matthew is definitely talking about the spiritually poor. And, and they said, but we don't know how to fix that. And, and every one of these uh, people had a different idea of how to get these Beatitudes, which are the same Beatitudes, to somehow mean something different in Luke than they do in Matthew. And right away, when you see people straining to, to get scriptures to line up, you know that there's a problem in there. And so, um, so but what we can see here, if we just take these two and, and accept the fact that they're both talking about physically poor, then we can see that the in the spirit part is just clarifying who blesses. It's talking about the spirit is the one who is blessing these people. And, and so what uh, the verse would be better to say, blessed are the poor, comma, in the spirit. Or you could say, using a different preposition, blessed are the poor to the spirit, or blessed are the poor by the spirit. Now, these other ones, especially to the spirit, blessed are the poor to the spirit. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Blessed are the poor by the spirit. That one really makes sense, because that's just saying that the spirit is the one who is blessing the poor. And, and so... All you have to do to the written text that's in there is add this little comment and a comma and understand that this is a, is a separate cause that is clarifying who is giving the blessing. And it's not, it doesn't mean poor in the spirit as a phrase, as a noun phrase, uh, talking about the poor. And so that's the only thing you have to tweak to, to get this to make sense. You don't need to have this complex interpretation that, that changes all of the other Beatitudes as well. And so this little comma can be very important there. And there are other places in the Bible where the placement of a comma is really important as well. And, and so uh, the message here is that the poor receive a blessing by way of the Spirit, by way of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's really all that there is to it. And so what we get is a much simpler uh, understanding. We get an understanding that everybody can look at and read. So when you read the Bible, and, and even if you uh, don't understand what that in the Spirit is saying, you still get the right understanding of, of what that beatitude is about. It's talking about the poor, the literally physically poor people. And, and um, one other aspect of that is that the translation that I work from um, is, is uh, different and it doesn't have this translation problem. In fact, uh, the author of that translation puts in a comment about um, this error uh, that is often uh, misinterpreted by people. Any questions on that? Okay, moving on. So now we can actually begin to look at the Beatitudes the themselves. Um, and well, I'm not going to get very far into this. I knew this was going to be a two-part episode. Um, so 
Um, what we've seen so far is just a little bit of a look at, at the Beatitudes, and, and I want to open up the scope just a little bit here uh, to the whole Sermon on the Mount, and then we'll narrow it back down to the Beatitudes again. And so this whole Sermon on the Mount message was given by Jesus to his disciples. And you can clearly see that in, in Luke, if you're looking at the Luke verses, it talks about Jesus uh, raising up his eyes and speaking directly to his disciples. And the reason is, uh, as Matthew says, that Jesus had separated himself from the crowd and gone up into a mountain and his disciples with them. And, and uh, so when they get there and get together, um, he gives them this Sermon on the Mount, which in Matthew is like four or five chapters long. And and it's a whole bunch of teachings for his disciples that he wants to give to them uh, about all, all the um, teachings that they're ultimately going to be teaching other people. And so he's kind of preparing them for the teaching they'll be doing and preparing them for some other things too. And, and we need to understand a little bit about what the Sermon on the Mount is. Um, Jesus was often teaching Judaism to the Jews. And, and that was the case here. Um, Part of what, well, certainly John the Baptist did, um, his, a lot of his focus was to bring the Jews back to Judaism so, cause, because they had slipped so far away from that. And, and uh, Jesus did some of that too. Some of the teaching things that he did was just bringing up old concepts from Judaism and reteaching them again to the, to the Jews because they didn't understand that. And so all of the Sermon on the Mount is not a new teaching. It's, it's old stuff and you can find references just like a lot of it in um, the Old Testament. And so it's not a specifically Christian teaching, although it's, it's something that's in common between the two. Um, both uh, Judaism and Christianity are the same on what Jesus is teaching here. And, and the reason, as I said, is that the Jews had wandered far away from God at this time. Um, they had no spiritual sense. We, we see Jesus complaining many times about their, their lack of any spiritual sense. And, and so part of what Jesus worked was uh, to bring them back to the Judaism that they were supposed to have been. And, and so we, and we can know that. We can know that this is Judaism uh, that he's teaching because one of the Beatitudes appears in the Old Testament. And so this comes from Psalm 37, verse 11. And it says, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So in this verse from Psalms, we see um, both the meek and the peacemakers Beatitudes uh, listed there. So Jesus is really just teaching um, what should have been already known by the people but they had fallen so far away that they no longer understood these things. And so the theme of the Sermon on the Mount is really summarized, I think, in this way. Jesus is saying, there is the physical and there is the spiritual, and the spiritual is much better and more important to God. And, and this is really reestablishing Judaism, I said. They were supposed to have known this at this time, but they didn't know this, didn't, didn't understand that. So when you look at all of the Ser Sermon on the Mount stuff, you will see over and over again this idea of him saying well this is how the physical is but that's not so important the, the spiritual is what really matters and and he talks about that in in so many ways but i'm, I'm not going to go into all of the sermon on the mount here and so that's the the overview the theme of the sermon on the mount and and the main message of just the beatitudes which is the first part of the sermon on the mount um, is this um he's talking to his his disciples and he says to them he what the meaning of all of it is a time is coming when the world will make it very difficult to be my followers. And so that's what all of the uh, Beatitudes are about. It's, it's saying things are going to be difficult, but there's a, a better future coming. Uh, things are, you're going to be poor, but there's a better future coming. You're going to be so, in sorrow, but there's a better future coming. And, and so that's what the Beatitudes are, are doing over and over again, talking about that message of uh, life on earth is not going to be good to you. At this time, though, um, the, the Disciples haven't really seen any persecution, but uh, he's warning them here that they're going to see persecution in the future. And so the Beatitudes also contain another message, um, and uh, it's kind of a little hint in there. We'll, I'll show it to you when we get to that. But in one of them, he hints at that question that he asks at other times, who am I to say these things? And, and so there's something in one of the Beatitudes where, where Jesus is saying, listen to me, I'm, I'm telling you I'm God. Um, I, the only person who could tell you this is God. And so um, we'll see that as we get to that. Okay, so this physical and spiritual dichotomy, we'll call it, uh, that is in this Sermon on the Mount, and particularly in the, in the um, Beatitudes, um, is an important message for that audience, as I said, because they've become so very physically oriented and, and they have little spiritual understanding. And Jesus talks about that over and over again. 
and, and, and says, how can you be a teacher of my people when you, when you don't understand the spiritual things? And, and the pastor actually used a verse last week where he said, um, uh, quoted, um, how, how can you understand uh, the spiritual if you don't understand the physical? And so over and over again, Jesus is required to um, uh, tell them, teach them about um, that there's a spiritual world and it's much more important than the physical world that they live in. And, and the Old Testament was, a, was meant to build this spirituality. You can, you can see um, in the Old Testament that you're, it's supposed to be a guide for them to build up a spiritual understanding. But it required careful reading. Yeah, you had to really carefully read the Bible and understand it and think about it. And the Bible itself does say that you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to really focus on the Bible. Uh, when you rise up in the morning, read it. When you go to bed, read it. Uh, and, and all of that over and over again. And, and so it was necessary for the people in that time to build up their spiritual sense by reading and understanding the written word. And so our advantage in this time, in this covenant, is that the Holy Spirit is the one guiding us to this. And, and so we don't need to understand the Bible so well because the Holy Spirit will guide us and, and help us to understand the things that are going on and warn us about things. So that's really a big advantage because reading the Bible in that detail and understanding in that detail um, is difficult and largely escapes most people. So there's a few examples here that I, I wanted to uh, show you about that difference. Uh, from the, This is from Sermon of, of, of the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. Um, and this is where Jesus is doing that physical versus spiritual thing in his teaching. So the first one comes from Matthew 5, which is just like 20 verses after the Beatitudes. Um, and it says, But I am saying to you, everyone who looks at a woman so as to lust for her immediately commits adultery with her in his heart. So right there he's saying adultery is not just a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. It's what's in your heart that matters. Then Matthew 5, 30, a couple of verses later, it is profitable for you that one of your members be lost and not that your whole body fall into Gehenna, into the fire. So um, what he's saying there is it's better that your physical body be lost and, and that you don't lose your spiritual self. And, and then from Matthew 6, 3, 4, whenever you do charity giving, let not your left hand know that your, what your right hand is doing so that your your charity may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you in public so again there's that idea of, of your physical giving of, of charity um, is, a, is a spiritual aspect and, and your, your father wants you to do that in secret and he will reward you in, in public if you do it in secret so over and over again what we see in the entire um, Sermon on the Mount is this idea of there's a physical and there's a spiritual, but the spiritual is what God really cares about. Okay, so we're just about to get to our first beatitude and um, and then we'll be done for today. Um, so the beatitudes are a list of specific groups of people. Uh, it starts with the poor and then it goes on to the mourning and uh, other groups are listed. And associated with each group, there's a blessing. So they're all in this format of blessed are those who are, are this, for they will receive this. And, and so over and over again, that pattern shows up in, in there. And so these blessings are related to the group situation in all, the, all cases. The, the part that's over here is, makes sense for the situation that's over here is what I'm saying. So for the poor, what's, what they will receive over here makes sense for the poor. And for the mourning, what's over here makes sense for the mourning. And some of those are easier to see than others, but I'll, I'll take you through that as we go through each of the Beatitudes. So, um, that, but that blessing is related to the group situation in all of the cases. Um, the group situation is present and physical, okay? And, and, but the blessing part of it, so the, the situation here is always something that is in the present and is a physical thing. The part over here is always future and spiritual. Um, and, and so this ties in again to that physical versus spiritual theme of the entire sermon that, that I mentioned before. And so the future that's described here is not just in the near future. It's talking about uh, when Jesus comes. It, it's um, the present life must completely change for this future to come about uh, that's, that Jesus is talking about. And so it's not near term future. It's um, long term future when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. So. This is the situation up here. I was supposed to push the buttons earlier here and I forgot to. And the blessing part is over here. Okay, so this is our first beatitude, which we've kind of beaten to death already, but we'll look at um, a little bit more here. 
and then we'll be done for today. Uh, blessed by the Spirit are the poor, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now notice that uh, this is the translation that I work from, and notice how he's phrased that. He says, blessed by the Spirit are the poor. And, and uh, he uh, understands that, that it's talking about by the Spirit. Remember, we talked about you could say in the Spirit or by the Spirit or to the Spirit, and, and a lot of other prepositions could be used there. And, and he believes that by is the best one and makes the most sense here. And, and it does. It, may, it results in a sentence that makes sense. Um, and so what we see here, the present physical situation that I talked about that part is poor. These people are, are poverty. They don't, they don't have hardly anything. And the future spiritual situation is the kingdom of heaven. But this one is a little unclear what is meant by kingdom of heaven. In fact, kingdom of heaven gets used again as the blessing that's going to come to a different group. And, and we looked at Luke's anti-beatitudes, his, his woes, and that helps us to understand what is meant by kingdom of heaven here. Uh, in Luke, we talked about, uh, he talked about the rich have comfort, okay? He says the rich have received their comfort and therefore woe to them. There will be no comfort coming to them in the future is the implication. And, and so he says they came by way of their physical wealth. So we understand then that what is meant by kingdom of heaven here is comfort. So the, the poor who have no money and, and can't be comfortable will receive their comfort in the kingdom of heaven. And so Comfort comes by the kingdom of heaven is, is the message here. And, and so we're going to see this pattern over and over again of this situation. These people are, are poor, and then their blessing is going to be something that resolves or is the opposite of their, pauper, uh, their poverty or, or whatever their situation is. So um, they're, they are presently physically poor people, which means that they, they often don't have a place to live or call their own. They don't have anything that they really own. They, they, um, they don't even know where their next meal is coming from, perhaps. And, and so um, that's their current situation. And in the future kingdom of heaven, they will have the comfort of spiritual wealth. And, and so we see the, the future spiritual aspect here. And, and here we see the present um, aspect of poverty here. I hope that's made sense to people. And we will pick it up next week.